this morning and tonight. So take your Bibles with me, if, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 6. That's our text for uh, today, the rest of the evening. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4 in particular. And that will be our text for today as we look at not provoking them and bringing up our children. Ephesians chapter 6, so let's read it. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. He says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up, bring them to maturity in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So much contained in that. It's like a, a condensed version of what the Bible says about the raising of kids. A lot is just piled in it. We're going to pull it out. So just to review for those of you from this morning or new this evening, glad to have you here. A little bit on your notes, some preface comments, uh, but take responsibility for your family. He addresses fathers to take response. It's an attitude of the heart fleshed out and what you invest in them. Uh, we never said, well, there's nothing more we can do. We've never said that. There's always more you can do. Some say we're baffled on what to do that would connect with our kids and get their attention and discipline that would work for them. And, but we never said there's nothing more we can do. We might just prayed harder. And we never said, well, that's all you're going to get. You never say that. There's more you could get. And so it's an attitude of the heart fleshed out in how, in how you invest in them. And there's been too much delegating of this letter A. We've been way too dependent on other people raising our kids for us and giving that to them. So though other people help, you never delegate that to them. You take it to yourself. And the exhortation is directed to you, to fathers, to fathers who bring them up. Number two, to work together. The word father, uh, you have different roles in the family. Moms and dads are different, have different roles in the family. We talked about that this morning. But you're one and should cleave together. You're in this together. You're to submit to one another. In Ephesians 5.21, the fruit of the Spirit is revealed by a, a submissive spirit to one another. I, I respect Sandy's input on in everything that we do. I value that and I needed that we're in this together. The word fathers are translated parents uh, in Hebrews 11. And so the address here is to moms and dads, the leadership of the dad, working together to raise your kids. That's how it works. It's significant. This is a template here of uh, things we have to flesh out. Number three, do not provoke your children to anger. A clear exhortation here, uh, do not provoke your children to anger, which means to come alongside of them and actually stir their hearts where there's a settled resentment or uh, outbursts of anger or they become disheartened. In fact, the word provoke in Colossians 3 means to stir them. It could be stir them to anger or stir them to zeal, but here you stir them up and you dishearten them and they lose heart. So this is a primary thing. He mentions it first here before he talks about bringing them up, and he mentions it only in Colossians 3. So this is a primary thing. He starts with this, interestingly enough. He says to not provoke them to anger. Don't stir them up. This suggests the possibility they might be doing that. He's basically telling them that they should stop. It means we, that we're responsible, that we might be responsible for their condition of the heart. And so they're responsible before God for how they obey and honor. So there's no... There's no uh, get-out-of-jail-free card here for kids. Your parents might be unreasonable from time to time, and may, you, you might disagree with them, but obedience is no virtue if you agree with them. It's when you don't. It may not be fair, and they're not God, so they don't know everything, and they're going to try hard, but you're called upon them to obey and honor them whenever they tell you what they, what they believe you should do. And you're accountable before God for that, but all, we can't give up that responsibility that we might be responsible for them having a disheartened spirit and maybe having provoked them. Now, what's missing here is what provokes them. You notice that it's not here, it's a principle, so it begs the question, what kind of things might we do to provoke them? I think we're meant to think about that. It's a template here without the detail, but we're going to look at um, a list today. So this is the key time for the person I hand these out, going to come up and hand these out. Um, this so you didn't peek at them earlier, and you're always tempted to look at what you have. So now is the time. The cat's out of the bag. And so it does beg the question, what might provoke them? We have to think about that. The Bible has principles and implications that we're supposed to figure out. It doesn't tell us what they would be, but I don't think it's hard. Um, I know what provokes me. In the, I know what be, would provoke me in the workplace. I've done these things to our kids. 
I've seen others done to our kids. So based on those three things, I put together the list. This is called the list, or some called it the guilt list, things that parents do to provoke their children. So you can add to the list or say, hey, we stopped doing that one. Yay. Your kids might go, yeah, we do that all the time. So this is designed to answer the question, what things might we do to provoke them? And it could be this is done unwittingly, unknowingly. We don't even know it, but it's good to think about that, that we might be unwittingly provoking them, and that might explain the attitude of your kid's heart. So without further ado, here is the list. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. Uh, you might expand on the list, maybe use these for family discussion, or moms and dads for devotion. Look up all the verses. We'll not do that tonight. And uh, this is my attempt at what kinds of things could provoke them. Number one, always tell them no. That's the easy, lazy default language the kid's asking. It's just a way to say, I'm not interested, I'm too busy, so don't, let, don't, don't bother me. And we just say, no, no, no. And so that would provoke me. It's not a thoughtful answer. Maybe the answer should always be no. When they're young, they don't know what's right. They always want selfish things. So maybe that's the, the best answer most of the time. But it's lazy. And if we always tell them no and never say, I'll think about it, or that's a good question, we just come lazy. And that would provoke them to always tell them no. To be fair or unreasonable would provoke them. That wasn't fair. That wasn't reasonable. I wasn't guilty. That could provoke them. We don't like being treated unfairly as well. Or the punishment doesn't fit the crime. It's too harsh, too severe. A lot of, people, a lot of parents, instead of training kids along the way, pent up all the anger, then dump when they hit the bot button, you know? And then they think that's being, no, that's just being angry. And, and the well builds up instead of along the way correcting and instructing, it just builds up till they just push them over the cliff and they just bark at them. And we become harsh. And so, and we say, and we say well, this, and the punishment doesn't fit the crime. It's too severe. Or being too quick to judge without getting the facts. Proverbs eighteen thirteen talked about the foolishness of answering a matter before you hear it. So go do some investigating, be a little bit of a, a Sherlock Holmes to figure out what, the best you can what really happened before you make a judgment call. And so that would be provoking them. Being harsh, yelling, or disciplining in anger like none of us have ever done. Um, I have some moments I'm not too proud of, you know, driving along in the car and they're bickering. He's on my side, she's across my line. Knock it, if I could hit them, you know, the arm, arm goes back. I'm going to pull over the side of the road. You know, if I could hit something, I would, and not my finest moment. And it was petty stuff, and that isn't helpful. It's sinful. Proverbs 51 says, A soft anger turns away wrath. Galatians 5 talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And James chapter 1 says, Be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Because the anger of man does not work the righteousness of God. It doesn't produce that. It just provokes them. So be careful to train them and discipline them with calmness. Not recognizing differences in children. Your kids are different from each other. I mean, they're different, period, but they're different from each other. Different stages of life, different personality, things work in them that don't want to circle certain kids. You have to understand your kids. And as you spend time with them, you learn and you recognize differences. There are principles that apply across the board. There's uniformity in a family, but how you apply them depends on these differences. Understanding the nature of childhood, train up a child in the way he should go, when he's old, he won't depart from it. That that doesn't mean there, teach them the Bible and then never forget that. That's not what that is teaching. We teach elsewhere to give them the Bible. What it's saying is teach them according to their way. According to their station, according to their path, their journey, the station, like we teach them according to that, understanding their unique journey in life, their age, uh, station in the family, personality. Uh, I have a friend uh, who was saved back in Carroll, and he was kind of a brain and how to teach his son about coal. He used the word bituminous with a two year old. Can you imagine that? Then he said, You know, it's a rock that burns, son. Got it. Okay. That's what he's talking about. So you train them according to their way, and they'll go through phases of life, the twos, the fours, the sixes, the tens, the fifteens, and it's going to change. And so you teach them according to their way, and they will never forget it. 
Not discerning between rebellion and other stuff, like just regular accidents that just happen. Spilling the milk doesn't always mean a spanking. It might, if we warn them and warn them and warn them, and it did it, that gets corrected. If it just happened, I spill the milk. It depends. And so we just clean it up, move on, nothing is said. We have to use discernment. Hebrews 5 talks about developing discernment by putting the scripture to use. Discerning between attitudes of the heart and just being kids or having an accident, we discern that. A lack of genuine praise. It's when kids are little and they're growing, there's so much they do wrong. Yeah. We're always correcting because they're sinful and they're immature and they're ignorant. A lot of it is correcting they haven't learned yet, haven't maybe come to Christ yet. And so a lot of it is what they did wrong. But sometimes they do something right and we don't say a word. And it could be small. It could be almost unrecognizable. But something deserving of that was well done, son. You know, it doesn't take much of that to encourage them. But a lack of genuine praise. I remember at work we were told... To not always do that. Before you correct someone, even at work, I worked at UPS, was a supervisor there. Before you correct them, tell them something they did right before you tell them what they did wrong. Jesus did that in Revelation 2. Sometimes I told a guy, thank you for coming to work today. (laughs) However, you know, I had to look really, really hard. (laughs) Our instinct is to just come down on them and never notice genuine praise. We all know that. Never being good enough. Having standards so high that only God can meet them. Telling them, God forbid, you'll never amount to anything. Or you're not like your sister. Or I wish you were like your brother. Having standards that they can't reach. Uh, And not being clear. We're not as clear as we think we are, (laughs) ever. (laughs) Was the bulletin, right? Or is an announcement, oh, if it had just been the bulletin, it was. You know, we're not as clear as we thought we are. And so we have to be clear on expectations and offenses. Why do you think you're getting a spanking today? And let them give back to you. And they, you might be surprised what they think they're being disciplined for. And so be clear in your expectations and offenses, or that could provoke them. Or not allowed to make something right. The restoration is the goal of all chastening to have a full circle of an accountability and forgiveness and making it right, and we're done. The discipline is only a way of showing consequence, but the goal is to have them restored to fellowship with God and with you. If we deny them that, we're left them hanging with merely consequence. And so we, it's full circle until you're done, and what do we do? And forgiveness is the ultimate goal, and then you're done. And you can't deny them that or leave them hanging, but just holding them accountable, which is important, but just doing that, we leave them short and said having restitution made. Favoritism. Loving some kids more than others. Overprotection, either lawnmower appearance, mowing down every obstacle, hovering over them all the time. There's a balance that we, I'll talk about that in a bit. Expecting more than they're able to do. It says that God knows our frame. He's mindful that we are dust, provides a way to escape. And so he he knows what we can handle. And so we have to not give them more than they can handle. However, kids can handle more than we typically think they can. Even understanding scripture. So we're careful not to. We're not, number 16, to not forgive them. We talked about that earlier. And just not enjoying them and playing with them and loving them, spending time with them, vacations and laughing, including them and where the family goes on a trip. God gave them to you to enjoy. And so this isn't just about accountability. It's enjoying them, laughing with them, rolling on the floor. Um, We have to do that with them. I don't do that anymore much. I just can't ever get up. (laughs) Not allowing for childishness. Meaning kids are going to be kids. They're going to be curious, adventurous, Sometimes it's dangerous and we have to be careful about allowing kids to be kids, be childish, the curiosity, the adventurous. And so we let them be children and we kind of envious of what maybe we used to be. Not living a real and genuine life, compartmentalizing our life where it's the, the, 
the me at church and the me at home are two different people, and we're not genuine with them. Making promises you cannot or do not intend to keep. We normally give, we, we normally give them when we threaten, we just come across and say, oh, you did this once more, I'm going to do this. And so without thinking about what we're really telling them, we make a promise there's no way we can keep, whether it's something good or something accountable, and they just don't listen. They don't listen. We lived in Alaska as a civil engineer, and we lived in a construction site remotely, and there was a couple that lived next to us in the trailer, and um, none of us were believers, but we had at least a consciousness of this idea. And the mom of the two little girls would always threaten them with things that you'd never do, and Sandy would fly to town once a week in the float plane to get groceries and pack the kids in, and, and the wife would pack her kids in, and they were always, they were terribly undisciplined, of course, ours were perfect. But anyway, <laughs> and, and the mom said, you do that one more time, I'll throw you out the window of the plane, which is not possible because they're all locked. They're all no... And so the kids go, yeah, right. Okay, so, and, and that's not the end of the story. They had a dog named Nikki who was Malamute, which is part wolf and part husky. Beautiful dog, steely blue eyes. And the, and the daughters would play with Nikki's food when Nikki was eating and tease it with the bowl. Never mess with someone's food, even adults, and especially dogs. And she'd tell them to stop. Do you think they stopped? No, because they didn't listen to her. No threat was ever kept. And so Nikki grabbed on the girl's face and dug her teeth into her eye socket, and they airlifted her to town in the middle of the night with a helicopter, which they typically don't do. And they saved her life and, and fixed her scars. She made threats she never intended to keep, so never took them seriously. Pressuring them to love what you love, or maybe what you failed at, <laughs> and live vicariously through them, vicariously through them all the time through sports, uh, and, and making them love. Now, we introduce our kids to a broad base of things, so they, they experience a lot of things in life. Our son, Danny... Um, I took them hunting. I even bribed them with M&Ms from Casey's every time we went road hunting. That they remember. <laughs> they remember what they got. Was it Twizzlers and M&Ms? And I would bribe them and we'd have a fun. But he, never, he, can, he can hunt, but he doesn't. But I have a wife that hunts, so that's kind of fun. I never made him do it. He liked basketball. We went to every basketball game. Everywhere they went. And so we didn't try to force on him things that we love to do because he was different than me. Or never tell them you love them. You know, we're so used to spanking, disciplining, correcting, especially in the early years. So God gives them a new heart and a conscience and they begin to love Christ and have a sensitive conscience. Until that time, a lot of it is just no, no, no. And we never tell them we love them. I like when my wife tells me. I like when she says, I call him honey. Now, you don't call me that, but I'm, I like when she, we still do that. And every time we text, we end with, love you. I don't, I don't think you ever get tired of that. Men, your wives never get tired of that. Never heard a wife say, hey, make my husband stop. I'm tired of him telling me he loves me. I'm just had it to hear with that. Never heard that happen. And when's the last time you told a kid you love them? It should be often. Because even when you chasten them, you do it because you love them. That's an expression of love. Love is not merely a hug. Love could be accountability and discipline and pain. Because you love them, you want to drive sin out of them. So just never tell them you love them, and they'll start believing that you don't. Or make that love conditional. That's even worse. And never ask them for forgiveness. Sometimes you, you have to ask your kids to forgive you for things. And why would we not do that? Pride. Why should you do it? Because you sinned against them. What happens to them when you do that? You're, they're elevated in, in their eye because you were real to them. Or no one's exempt from that. Or always give them leftovers, like leftover time. And if you're in, in ministry and, and working and life is busy, never just give them leftover time. Set apart time just for them and guard it with your life been a pastor for 28 years, in ministry for 36 years, and sometimes it was 
a basketball game that we purposed to go to. We had people come with and say, oh, pastor, my life's falling apart. Well, that's been the last 20 years, so um, it can probably wait till Monday. <laughs> right? Okay, and th- that's part of the dysfunctionality. So it's better for them to wait. Now, if it's a real emergency and I dropped everything, they would understand. But something was protected just for them. And they heard me on the phone and say, no, I've got a ball game tonight to go to. Could we do this tomorrow? They still remember the phone calls where I told people, no, I had plans with my kids and it could wait. They remember those times. I didn't want them to hate God and hate the ministry, so just don't give them left word. Or in the context, just don't train and counsel them and they'll be left to themselves. So that's the list. You can add to it, fill out your own, but it's good to think about. And so by the grace of God, Paul tells us to stop. He said, just put a stop to this. And so I think it's good to think about. All right, the flip side, this, that was this morning. So now tonight, we'll go on. These are principles. Every one of them is clear and significant. The next one is the heart of it. Bring them to maturity. Bring them up means to bring them to maturity. It's the same word, nourish, in chapter 5 with husband loving their wives. Nourish them is the same word here. So we are to care for them, provide for them like you care for a farmer cares for his field and you care for your pets. You feed them so they grow. And so we are to bring them to maturity and don't leave them to themselves or don't overcome by over sheltering them. We have to bring them to maturity. Now we've known believers who say, well, it's just kind of a hands off method. I say, that's not a, bit. a child left to himself is a disgrace to whom? His mother. Yeah, so we don't leave them to themselves. They're supposed to be, bring to maturity by training and by counseling. And so we are, you know, what, what's maturity? Well, maturity biblically is wisdom, discernment, you know, thoughtfulness, skillfulness in the word, a selfless spirit, a serving spirit, an awareness of others and application of things to life, taking initiative, all the things that are maturity. We want our kids to not live in my house forever. I want them to grow up and move on, prepare them to live a life for God when we're not, we're not their mom and dad living in our home anymore. We're to, we train them to leave us. About 18 to 20 years to do that. Plenty of time. We train them to be responsible, mature adults, that God would work in them to invest in our people. And so we're to mature them where they can live on their own. We told them, we can't watch over you every moment of the day. And sometime we won't, you'll be out from under our roof. We won't, we won't be there at all. And so we have to teach them to walk with God and mature them. And that's the goal, to bring them up to maturity. So just a couple of things here by way of implication. Uh, do not make every decision for them. Now, when they're younger, you pretty much make every decision for them because they don't know. You don't just say to a two-year-old, get ready for church. Right? <laughs> you really spell it out. You know, brush your teeth and... You know, to fall. wash your hands after using the in the bath. All the stuff you lay it out early, right? Everything, and then as they grow older. You say, just get ready for church. So, at some point, you don't make every decision for them. Don't remove every obstacle or difficulty and make life easy for them. Don't be a lawnmower parent or helicopter parent that mows down every obstacle. These are good for them. Life is difficult, and we have to prepare them for difficult things and hard things. And don't, don't protect them from the consequences of their own choices. Don't try to avoid them or cover them, remove them. Let them feel the weight of their sin. Don't side with your child against authority figures necessarily. Don't just say, oh, yeah, that was a bad person. Now, my mom, when I was in junior high school, um, I had a homeroom teacher that was unfair to me. I was going on a band trip, and he wouldn't let me take the test early, and he just didn't. And so I didn't fight it, just told my mom. So he went to the principal, and he corrected that. That's the right way to handle it. But we can't be defending our kids against authority. Oh, the football coach was mean to me. Oh, just tough up a little bit. So be careful not to do that. What we do is gradually give them freedom with accountability. We gradually give them more decisions to be made with parameters, with directions, with guidelines and accountability for it, we take them back if they abuse that. 
We teach them wisdom. Wisdom is God's perspective on life and cause and effect of things. This leads to that. That's proper. This leads to that. So don't start here. And so we give them wisdom that comes from God. Hold them accountable. Make them feel the weight of their choices. God wants them to feel the weight of their sin, of their choice. He wants them, that part of them growing to hate sin and say this leads to that. And that was painful. So don't shield them from that. Let them feel the weight of that. Don't cover for them. Let them feel it. Let them hold their feet to the fire, uh, Sandy will say. Uh, Sandy's the dean of women at faith and has 140 girls that she works with, and some of them more than others. And they, they love her. She, they call her like the teddy bear with a shotgun. We hunt together, so this is an interesting little picture here. The teddy bear, and she will give her life for them but she'll hold them accountable, and they love that. And so we hold them accountable, feel the weight of their choices, praise them accordingly, or remove privileges accordingly. And here are three motivations for your kids. They either do it for Christ, which is the highest motive. They have a conscience with a sense of duty, response, which is not a bad motive, or it has to cost them something. We're incentivized by what something costs us. And so part of the training, the next word is train and counsel is the blanks you can write them in. We train and counsel them. Part of training is giving them what we expect of them, laying out how that works and all of that and hold them accountable and praise accordingly and accountability for what they do or don't do. So we connect what we expect of them with what they do. And it has to cost them something. And so at some point we have to figure out what will cost them and hold them accountable. And so we train them. The word train here, the word discipline, we think merely a punishment, but it's a bigger word. It means to train a child. So the, the training is not just when you have to hold them accountable. It's the whole process of training them to be mature. This more than just the spanking or go to your room or you're going to lose privileges. This is the whole concept of training them to bring them to maturity. And so see it more than just that. It's, it's actually training them to grow. And so this is, this is what it is, to bring them to maturity. Uh, counseling them is the word nuthesia. It, it means to verbally instruct them with a view to correct them. So this is the two-pronged approach to bring to maturity is the goal by training and by counseling. So we give them what we expect and hold them accountable and praise them to do well and it costs them when they don't. And God uses that to produce a love for righteousness because this is how we use that. But, but we use the training and then we verbally counsel them and say, nope, this is what we do. And so you correct them. And it's not one or the other, it's both. That's the two-pronged approach to training in kids is training and counseling and holding them accountable and then instructing them verbally. And we've known people do one or the other, and it's actually both. And so we train them and we counsel them. So letter A, we do this from the scriptures. We do this from the scripture. We go to the word and we do it from the word of God. We do this from the scriptures. We do this in an admonition of the Lord and according to his words. We look at God's word and we do it from the scriptures. We do this constantly. <laughs> this is why moms are always tired, you know, just exhausted because this, we do this constantly. Uh, so we start early in life. How early should you start training your children? The Bible says, now Timothy, we find out that from, in, from infancy, he learned the scriptures. Before he could read, before he could fully understand, is the word child, is the word in, from infancy, his mom, his mom and grandma taught him the scriptures. So you start in infancy. Uh, we started reading to our kids when they were still in the womb. They can hear your voice. So I've been told, I don't remember. Oh, hi, mom. You know, I don't remember that day. But I've been told they can hear your voice, and they know. So in infancy, they teach them the scriptures, and never a time when they don't remember hearing the word of God. And we also find that how quick did they go astray? From the mother's womb, they go astray, speaking like they lie to you the moment they're born, or soon after. And, and you know that their pants have been changed, and their tummy's all full, and they've been all burp like we talked about this morning. And they scream bloody murder when you put them back down. You know why they did that? They want to be picked up and then they stop. That's the test. They just lied to you. Nothing's wrong with them. They just, you denied them what they wanted. 
And my Bible says, do not spare for their crying. Don't let it get to you. It's a manipulation. Kids, we know how you work. I was one and we had them. It's a manipulation tactic to cry and scream. Don't spare for the... We'd quote that to our kids when they would scream. I said, it's not going to work. And then we'd laugh at them. Their face would turn red and we'd say, we'd just laugh and take pictures. And we, have, we still have those pictures. Let not your soul spare for their crying. Don't give in to them because they're lying to you. And so you start early. It's never too late to start, but you start early. And we stay with it. We do this diligently. You look at Deuteronomy 6. We'll talk about that in a few moments. You stay with it. You teach them diligently. And then you seize the moments. And Deuteronomy 6, I'm going to turn there for just a moment. When we read this passage, of course, we got saved in our 20s, had no knowledge of the Bible. Everything was fresh and brand new. We read Deuteronomy 6 one and said, wow, that's the process of bringing them up. The template is training and count, but what does that process look like? Is it limited to devotions? No. Is it just bringing them to church? No, it's not just that. Look at Deuteronomy 6, and this was enlightening and life-changing for us. It always has been that to understand the process by which we transmit truth to our kids. Deuteronomy, and you know the passage. This is the, chain, the second law giving, Moses giving to the people on behalf of God. And so he's instructing the generation to the generation after them how it works. Verse 4, hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children and talk of them when you sit in your house. Hmm. And when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, everywhere you go, you teach them and you talk of him. And you'll bind them as a sign on your hand. mean, you keep the word of God in front of them, not just having little... P. Graham Dunn signs around your eyes, which I like, but you keep the word of God in front of them, and they shall be as frontless upon your eyes and write them on the door of the gates, and so you do this all of the time. And so teaching them is not limited to devotion, though you should have them a structured time. It's not limited to that. It's not limited to being a church or Sunday school. It's all of the time. You seize the moments. You buy up, and Paul talked about redeeming the time and buying opportunities, so it's when do you teach your kids? All of the time. And if you limited that to Sunday school, God to them will only live at church. If it only happens in devotion, God will not be real to them when you're not having devotions. It'll be so natural you talk about him when you're walking, when you get up, when you lie down. All the time you seize the moments and you talk of him all of the time. Everything should be a God conversation if you can make it. That's the, that was enlightening to us. And I remember we homeschooled our kids, and uh, it was relatively new back then. It, won't, but it was relatively new as a movement. We are kind of making it up as we went a little bit with some help. And, and one guy said, so when does your wife go from mom to teacher? I said, no. She's always a teacher. We just change subjects. Right? Could be math. Could be how to answer the phone. Could be geography. Could be how to write a thank you note. We're always teaching, and so we seize the moment. This is why you should be tired. But it's a mindset to say that's a teaching moment, not limited to devotions or Sunday school or VBS or family day camp, as important as these times. It's not big event after big event. It's all throughout every day you seize the moment. That is life-changing to understand that. That's the process. So here is some implication of that. You do this with patience, wisdom, mercy, and be thorough. Uh, this might be overwhelming tonight. I hope it isn't. It's a lot to process quickly. But I want you to think about these things. This is some of the things involved in training and counseling. There has to be instruction. You have to know what you expect of them. They need to be instructed, and so they're told in Proverbs 1.8 to give heed to the law of the mother and the teaching of the father. You have to be teaching them, instructing them what you expect of them. And this would have to do with uh, how they treat your furniture. Supper table rules, you have them. We don't get down to everyone's done eating, and so you, you have to instruct them. I think a lot of kids aren't disobedient because they've been told what to do. They're sinful, 
but lacking instructions, so we need to have expectations of them. Uh, dear family that we know in Carol, and they're so dear, they're a godly family, but some things just didn't connect with parenting. And they have a son who is not talkative and, and doesn't want to be, <laughs> and, and they don't make him. And so we talk to him, he says nothing, and the mom says, as a teenager, well, that's all you're going to get from him. I said, not in my house. The low expectations, and he could do so much more for God. Then there's clarification. This is what I mean by what I said. We're not as clear as we think we are, so make them recite back to you what did I just tell you wanted you to do. And so we think we're clear, and a lot of times we're not. And so clarify by having them say it back to you about what you want from them, what they're being disciplined for. And then there's illustration. You're a good illustrator. The Bible's filled with them. Analogies, metaphors, similes, parables. Jesus taught that way. My humble life professor said, if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for you. To use illustration to make a spiritual point, connect the known to the unknown by illustration. Life is filled with them. Get used to a reservoir of illustration. You, can, you ought to be just all the time. Well, this is like that. Jesus taught that way. Here's a fig tree. This is like you. Didn't he teach that way? We grasp things. Spurgeon said they're like the windows that let the light come in. And so get used to using illustrations. Um, if you've not heard of it, if you have, it's called Keys for Kids. Um, we use this with our kids in devotion when they were younger. One short verse, a key, a key thought, so look for one key thought, they had to guess what it was. Read the story about some kids doing something to teach a Bible verse. What do you think the key was? And so they'd guess it, and, and, and we say that they did or they didn't, and it was an illustration of a truth that they would remember. It's a good way to learn how to teach by illustrations and get your kid. You can get them at, I think, keysforkids.org. They still make them. One for every day of the year. Then there's application. What does this look like in your life? I think we've been good at Bible knowledge and truth, but not application to life. And so say, how do, how do you think you can flesh that out in your life? We teach them to make application, to be doers of the word, and to become skillful by putting these things to use, it says in Hebrews 5. And then there's observation. Do you know what's going on in your house as much as you physically can? How much do you work at that? Moms, you, you can almost appear to be omniscient to your kids. Here's the trick. You use strategically placed mirrors and shiny surfaces to see around corners. Right? Um, well, Proverbs says she looks well to the ways of her household. She knows what's going on as much as physically possible. And she say, hey, knock it off. And they go, we weren't even talking. How does she know that? The eyes in the back of the head think, no. It's not that. It's strategically placed like uh, mirrors and shiny glass surfaces or microwaves or open, crack the window on a hot day to hear the conversation. And, then, and she say, hey, knock off that. And she go, how does she know? Where moms are not omniscient, but they can find out what's going on. Observation. You want to know what they're doing, and it takes some work and some effort without hovering everywhere they go. You're looking to what's happening so you can correct it because this is all the time. Then there's something I call compensation, because it had to be something that, that, that kind of rhymed with the rest of them. I don't think I got too big of a hammer here to make it fit. But it has to cost them something. We, we, we reap what we sow. And so there are con- choices have consequences. If you jump off the roof, you can't choose not to fall. And wisdom sees that ahead of time. So you teach them that something will cost you something before they do it for Christ or have a conscience. We have to connect behavior. with con- We lay them out. We hold them accountable. We find what works and find what doesn't work. And so we do that. I remember one couple in our, one of our churches, and it wasn't Bethany. Um, they had a delinquent son, and they were a good couple, a godly couple, and just didn't really have a clue about parenting. And so they had a, a, literally a delinquent son who would come and go and steal his mom's stuff and uh, come in all hours of the night. And, said, and, and they said, well, he just shouldn't do it. I thought, why should he stop? So I asked him, say, say, what, what has it cost him to do this? And they said, nothing. I said, that's why. 
And, and, and they said, well, we shouldn't have to. They said, yes, you should. If you'd done this when he was two, do you want the 18-year-old version of that? <laughs> That's what I tell them. It should have cost him then. He had no, nothing cost him. He still got hot meals. So he got clean clothes. I said, deny him all of that, like Alcatraz. We've been there. You get health care and food, everything else is privilege. We showed that to our kids. That's our house right there. Everything else can be taken away. Make him clean his own clothes. Change the locks on your door and lock him out. I said, we can't do this. He said, you probably can't. We would. Nothing cost him. So he had no conscience. When our son Danny was a teenager, he bought his first car. As an older Camry, paid $1,500 for it. He was doing well, walking with God, going to head off to college soon. I said, Danny, you know how it works. I'm still your dad. You're still under our roof. I'm accountable for your behavior, and I'm not going to spank you, although we did spank them when they were 16. That shocked him. Hand came out of nowhere. It's more embarrassing than anything, but... You're not too old to spank. Act like a kid. You treat her like a kid. That was the end of it. I said, probably not anymore. So I said, here's the deal. I have just something to take away. I know what you value is your car. It's your freedom. It's your job. So you buy the car. You pay the money. You title it in my name. I own it. So I can take it away. He said, I get it, Dad. Never had to. The day he got married, I handed him the title and said, the car is yours. But we've done this since they were kids. This will cost you. Find, if your discipline isn't working, which can be frustrating, more spankings just isn't going to work. You ever been there? It just isn't going to work. You find it what they value, and then you take it away. Find out what will cost them, and it could be nothing com- compared to physical pain, and you take it away. They value something. Our son Danny, their daughter Lily, the second was just a little girl. We would go to a restaurant for birthdays, and, and uh, she was acting up and being whiny and complaining and just being naughty. Kids can sometimes be naughty. We learned that today. And so he didn't spank her. He put her in the corner facing us so she could see. She hated not being part of it. That just killed her. Didn't turn, and he said, you can't be part of us. He turned her around. And she couldn't be part of our party. And that got her attention. That's what cost her. Our daughter Amy, this was at Bethany. and uh, she, she, The big deal was she wasn't picking up her toys at the end of that. That's a huge crime, right? But at that age, that's a big deal. Not picking up all your toys, leaving a mess so someone else can pick it up. And so we said it'll cost you a nickel for every toy that we have to pick up at the end of the day. So you're going, okay. So we take her nickels, and we were very liberal with allowance. She got, they got a dime a week for every year of age. So if they were eight, they got 80 cents a week, and they tied this, so they were not real wealthy. But it cost her, it drained her dry. And it had no effect on her. She just smiled and gave us the money. You know, this isn't working. <laughs> she had no value for nickels. And so we prayed and said, oh, this isn't working, spankings aren't working. And so we finally said, ah. And we, there was a sweet shop on the east side of Des Moines, and we'd take our bikes and go get the little, the little candies, the penny candies with the little cute um, little paper bags you put stuff in and all that kind of stuff. And so we all said, let's go to the sweet shop, got on our bikes, and and, and end their quarter, take their money. And so our kids went, and she found out she got there and said, I don't have any money. Well, why is that? And then she got it because the candy cost her. It took a long time to figure that out. So you have to be creative. So that's what we make by compensation. That has to cost them something. Then there's correction. And we, we correct them. We have to correct them when things are wrong. There's restoration. There's affection. In the midst of, this, in the midst of all of this, we love them with all of our heart. In fact, a godly woman is taught by older women to have an affectionate love for her children. In Titus chapter 2, Older women teach younger women to love their children. That's phileo love, to have affectionate, to just care for them, to love them. You can tell with a law of kindness on her mouth, she speaks with wisdom. Repetition. They don't always get it the first time. <laughs> we have a pastor's wife, friend of ours, and she 
told her son once when he was, I don't know, three, eight months old, you know, don't touch, how much, 16 months? 18 months. Don't touch the VCR. What's a VCR? I know your data. My son. Video recorder, cassette recorder. Don't touch it. And he did, and she just blew her mind. I told him to not, and he did. Like once, he expected him. She said, yeah. I said, no, it could take several times. Really? Yeah. And then, so it took several times, and he finally stopped touching the VCR. Now he's a pastor <laughs> with his own kids. <laughs> Um, medita- meditation. We take our time with the Lord and anticipation. We trust that God's going to work. And I'm going to finish this quickly, but this is bringing them to maturity. All this is involved. I know it sounds overwhelming, but these are principles I hope you can apply to training and counseling them. Number five, we have to walk with God. So we're going back to Ephesians chapter six. We do this, the nurture and animation of the Lord within the realm of my walk with God, it's not just social things, the right thing. This is spiritual dynamic going on within the realm of being in Christ and of Lord. I do within the realm of that, within the sphere of my walk with God. I have to walk with him. And it's, it's, it's assumed in Ephesians 5 that he's talking to believers. Those who have come to Christ are in Christ, have life in Christ. And so you have to trust Christ as your Savior if you haven't done that yet. As a mom and dad. I've seen unsaved people raise good kids that are decent and respectful. They can't be godly kids. But that's where you start. You need Christ, and so you trust Christ as your Savior and have life in him. Let it be take ownership of your walk with God. Uh, Chapters 4 to 6 in Ephesians are about our walk. Chapter 1 to 3 is who we are in Christ, who we were, who we are, what we used to be, uh, what we have in him. Then he tells us to walk, walk worthy, walk in light, walk in love, walk in wisdom, walk in the spirit. So we walk. Take ownership of your walk with God. No one can do that for you. If you look at Deuteronomy 6, he says, these things have to be on your heart. A knowledge of God, an affection for him, a love for God, a knowledge of him has to be on your heart. You have to own that. And then you teach that to your children. They know if you've owned it or not. So take ownership of your walk with God. No one can do that for you. And so you have to walk with God. Take ownership of your walk with God and be with him. You need his help. You need his direction. And then you teach him his word. You teach them his word. You teach them diligently. While you walk by the way, we light up, you rise up. And so you teach them his word. And then you take them to his word. And the difference is, that when they do something, you have to talk about it. You say, let's go to the Word and see what God says about that. So you teach them to build a reservoir of truth, and you take them to his Word. And Ephesians 40, 32 can be effective for like five years of their life. That's almost the only verse you need, because they're unkind, and they're not tenderhearted, and they sin a lot. So we, we take them and say, like, kids can be mean to their siblings. Does that ever happen in your home? Like teasing and annoying and loving it? And, and, and loving, digging at that. And, uh, and they would say, was that kind? No. So though you become God's mouthpiece, you want them to deal with him. To, be, to deal with him. And so you go to his word. This is what God says about what you just did. Do you know why this is sinful? God said to be kind and tenderhearted and ask forgiveness. Is that what God says? So who do we have to ask forgiveness of? My sister. Oh, that's hard and my mom, and God. And so you take them to his word. I don't think we do enough of that. We teach them his word. We don't take them to the word. And so you understand why we're dealing with this. What does God say? And so you teach them to deal with God because someday you won't be there to do that for them. You won't be there. They'll be old. They'll be out of the house. They might be married. And so you take them to his word. And you talk of him everywhere you go. It says in Deuteronomy 6 that you talk of him everywhere you go. And so do you talk of him? I mean, God is in part of every part of life, creation. And you talk of him everywhere you go. And you talk about not just his word, but his works. There's a blank here. Put the word works in there. You talk of his works. And we can be good at teaching them his word, but not about his works, his power, his might, what he's doing in the world and doing in your life even this week. And Psalm 78, I encourage you to read it. 
There are five generations of truth getting to those that will eventually put their hope in him. Our fathers taught us this. We did not hide them from our children. And it says it talks about his works and his power and his might. That they might put their hope in him and not forget him and be rebellious like their fathers were. So as you talk of him, not just his word, but his, what is God doing in history and in your life at this week? What is God doing right in front of them that you have to point them out? And we, they need to teach, be taught to see the invisible hand of God. As believers, one of the biggest changes I've was seeing the hand of God in everything. I was a moral person, <laughs> a God-fearing person, not a saved person. I began to see God in everything. You talk about a, a lightning storm or a sunrise or sunset. Look at, and our kids would, we'd have a lightning storm and some parents say, oh, don't be afraid, which means they're going to be afraid. And they say, wow, God just painted the sky with fire. How cool is that? Wow. And that's part of his word. God created the rain. It's his rain, his thunder, his storm, his snow. And we tell them that. You talk of him all the time. This is what God did today to spare us from this crash. This is what God is doing with on the life of our neighbor. And so we talk of him everywhere we go. It'll be natural to do that and make that part of your life. We talk of him, his word and his works. And then you take them with you. Meaning you are to disciple them and involve them in life and ministry as much as you possibly can, whatever their age is. It's especially for pastors. You know, as you have kids, uh, we wanted them not to resent their dad being a pastor, always leaving them at home. So we took them with us as much as we could to evangelistic Bible studies. They were there watching their kids, doing their homework. And our people remember our kids being there to be part of evangelistic ministry. We took them to funerals. We took them to lock units to see teenagers who had fried their brains on drugs. Uh, we took them to hospitals. They watched people live. They watched people die. We explained life and death to them, how we can help people. We took them everywhere we possibly could. We take them. Kids are portable, and they're flexible, and they can handle that stuff, rightly taught. Don't deny them life experience. Take them with you like you did with Sam here. I like serving as a young kid. I like that. Don't always leave them at home, and it may be appropriate to do that, but take them with you to disciple them and attach themselves and they've experienced things of life. Then you take this seriously, like we talked about this morning. Psalm 78 talks about let, lest they forget God. Deuteronomy 6, forget God and his blessings. There's a lot at stake. My kids of my children yet to be born are at stake in Psalm 78. Five generations, the children of my grandchildren yet to be born, are affected with what I do today with my kids. That's a little bit intimidating, and so it matters how we invest in them. And then you trust God for this. You have to do it in his strength, in his might. It's within relationship with him. It's a lot to absorb in one time, but these are five basic principles of application I think should help. And just take something and run with it and say, Lord, help us to do this. It's a weak part in our marriage and our, our kids, and we want to work on that, and don't let it overwhelm you. But this is God's expectations of us, his provision for us, and God uses us as stewards of them. They're a heritage of the Lord. We raise them so, they, so God can use them. We don't to raise them so people say, oh, you got great kids. We love hearing that people love our kids. No greater joy than to hear their kids walk. We love hearing that people love our kids. But it's about God using our kids and generations to come to invest in the life of people for his glory. We raise them so he can use them. And a world is falling apart at the seams. It's always been that way, but even more so today. Make a difference in investing in your children and raise them up to serve and to love and pray that God would work in their heart to bring them to Christ, to love him and serve him. And we get the joy of being a steward of that. And God will help you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for the joy of being together today. It's been a great day. And Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your son who gives us life. Pray for anyone here today who's never come to Christ. 
and needs to put their trust in him to save them. If there were every mom and dad here that has kids, that they'd invest in them and train them and encourage them and counsel them according to your will and dependent upon you for strength. That you work in their hearts to raise up a generation of children who love God, who know Christ and want to serve him with all of their hearts till Jesus comes. So, Father, use your word, use your spirit to encourage us and challenge us today. We thank you for what you're doing here tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.